Hello and welcome to Stringham Real Estate Edge. This is part two of a two-part interview with Special Agent Scown from the Salt Lake City Office of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Welcome back. Thank you for having me again. Today's subject starts with a discussion of mortgage fraud, but could you give us a definition of what mortgage fraud is before we get started? Sure. It's basically any time that there's loans from a bank or any kind of financial institution where there's uh, fraud often in the origination, but it can be any time during the, the life of the loan. But but you, like I said, usually in the origination, and it can have anything to do with anything that goes in the application that the institution uses to decide whether they're going to make the loan. If there's lies in that, in that material, then that would be fraud. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, is the FBI the only agency that investigates uh, mortgage fraud, or are there other agencies that also uh, you work with? So we work with our state and local partners on these particular matters, and also other federal agencies as as they as they come along. Um, you know, Small Business Administration, Office of Inspector General, and other federal agencies as mm -hmm. well. Can you give us an idea of what the some of the penalties are for mortgage fraud? Or does that vary based on the, the level of the crime? It does vary. And so it's going to depend a lot on, on loss amount and if the person has a criminal history prior to um, this particular crime that they're involved in, um, kind of the sophistication of the scheme, the egregiousness, uh, you know, how how d different complexities that could th there could be in the particular crime. All that's going to play into how the judge ends up sentencing. Sure. As I understand it, mortgage fraud is broken into two categories. One is for for actual uh, profit, cash, money generated, and the other is just to occupy the house. Correct. Uh, is there is there a difference in penalties, one versus the other, or are they equally? It's all going to be the same kind of stuff that ends up getting charged. It's always always going to be going back to that federal wire fraud charges that we're looking at, and so you know. Uh, if it's a for-profit scheme and on a large scale, there could be larger dollar amounts involved, which is going to lead to larger penalties, but it's going to be charged usually fairly similarly. Sure. Is mortgage fraud generally increasing in the United States or is it kind of plateaued out? So that is difficult to answer. So back down during the financial downturn, you know, 2008 and, and those years surrounding that, the FBI was working a lot of mortgage fraud cases, and that's because the economy was in a downturn and there was kind of an uncovering of, a, of large amounts of mortgage fraud that was occurring across the United States. Right now, the economy, you know, I'm not an economist, but it appears that things are going quite well. Indeed. And certainly in the real estate market, things are going quite well. Certainly. So uh, it's hard to say how much mortgage fraud is occurring at the moment. I would, you know, my my guess would be that it, there there certainly is uh, fraud in the market, right? And especially when there's lots of money to be made with the, um, you know, increase in value of real estate properties. Uh, but exactly how much is in the market, it's hard to say uh, because, you know, as people continue to make payments, often sometimes those uh, fraudulent uh, statements to institutions don't get uncovered sure. until there's a problem. Generally speaking, when does the biggest number of mortgage fraud activities occur during an, a, an up economic market or in a down economic market or both? It's pro there's opportunities in both uh, in both sides of you know of 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 either an upturn or a downturn but certainly when there's large amounts of appreciation in real estate prices as you know as as if you get into a property and and you can sell it in a short time for a lot for more money there's certainly more incentive for people to commit fraud in sure. those instances. And I guess in this case too, because of the large number of zeros, these are generally expensive assets, that in itself tends to attract potential fraudsters. It's just a, uh, probably not an easy source, but but a way of generating a fair amount of profit over, Correct. over time, yeah. thus the willingness to take the risk. Correct. Is is Utah uh, an, in any greater area for mortgage fraud or, or Salt Lake than than any other state, or 
Is that a known statistic at this time? So it's pretty consistent across the United States, these same kinds of issues that can happen in real estate transactions and in you know uh, loans from financial institutions. They can happen in, in Utah, they can happen across any state. But you know some interesting things to think about is, you know, over the past couple of years, Utah is, is either number one or very close to the top as far as new home starts, um, which obviously you know leads us to to believe that there's a lot of uh, real estate movement in the market, we and that's certainly the case, right? Which, which lends itself to at least some of those transactions people are going to be entering into sure. fraudulently. What would, what would the attraction be for a a loan buyer? I believe it's called a straw buyer. What would the attraction be for a straw buyer to participate? Uh, in, a, in a mortgage transaction that uh, could lead to their possible indictment on a on a mortgage fraud transaction. Well, there's any number of w reasons that someone would be a straw purchaser in a transaction. Um, you know, probably one of the more common ones is that they're not actually interested in living in the property but they allow their name to be used as the purchaser so that an investor or someone else can purchase the property, maybe get some equity out of it as well, and, um, and, and then it forecloses. Obviously, then sometimes the straw purchaser can be left holding the bag, as it were, mm -hmm. but um, you know, they can receive a kickback on, on, as part of the transaction. Or it, There's lots of different angles that, uh, that fraud can occur on and, and a reason why someone who would be willing to be a straw purchaser. And, and would the straw buyer be just as guilty, even if they didn't realize that there was perhaps fraud involved? Definitely, because, um, you know, anytime there's a straw purchaser and, you know, they're making claims like, oh, I'm going to live in this property or this is my down payment amount. If some of those things aren't true, they're going to be held just as, as you know, culpable as the other people that they are engaged in their mm -hmm. conspiracy with. And I think that brings up a really important point for your viewers, which is any time that either as a real estate professional or when people are working with clients, anytime that there's going to be something that's going to be submitted to a financial institution that is not 100% true, they should not be involved in that or they need to fix it so that it is true because that's when people get into, into trouble. And sometimes, you know, in cases that I've worked, uh, you know, people tell small lies and think, oh, this isn't a big deal or this is what everyone does or this is just what the in how th things happen in the industry or the bank's okay with it. But Anytime you're signing your name to something or whether you're or anytime you're telling something to someone, you should always make sure that it's 100 percent true so that if there ends up being an issue with the transaction, you're not and uh, you don't end sure. up being criminally liable. What makes mortgage fraud a, a federal offense? Well, the banking system is regulated by the federal government, of uh, okay. and then credit unions are 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 insured federally sure. by the NCUA. Um, you know, banks are secured by um, by the FDIC, and because of that, that gives the federal gear, government jurisdiction in these transactions. Okay, so if two individuals conducted a real estate transaction and fraud was perpetrated, that wouldn't necessarily come within your jurisdiction then because it didn't involve a bank or our credit union or any other federally insured institution. It likely could fall within our jurisdiction uh, because even if it's even if there's not a loan involved and it's just a transaction between two individuals, two mm -hmm. private individuals, there's likely some sort of interstate wire transfer that occurs of funds, uh, which then is going to make it a, a potential federal fraud federal case. Federal crime. Correct. Are there particular types of properties, meaning condos or single family residents or high end luxury homes? Is there any concentration that you've seen over the years? It can really happen with any of those properties. Um, obviously, you know, higher dollar, you know, commercial properties are going to be, as you've mentioned, the more zeros, the, the more potential there is mm -hmm. for making money if you're willing to engage in fraud. Uh, but anything from, you know, the the least expensive condo all the way up to commercial properties, there can be fraud in those initiations. And, you know, uh, obviously people can, uh, you know, provide false information as far as, you know, debts that they already have that the bank may rely upon 
and deciding how risky a loan is going to be or, you know, um, employment, you know, providing false information about employment or, you know, kind of similar to that false information as far as how much income an individual has. Um, and also false information about, you know, down payments or about occupancy, whether that person is actually going to um, have occupancy of that property. All of those things are common things that we see as far as, um, you know, fraud is at least on residential properties that, that real estate professionals should be aware of and looking out for to make sure that they are protecting themselves mm -hmm. from. How is mortgage fraud detected? Is there, is there a, a process by which you would, or the banks would investigate every transaction, or is there what what triggers the fact that all of a sudden it comes to light? So we're not like in all transactions watching the FBI. That is, you know, watching and seeing if there's something suspicious going on. We don't have that authority, and nobody wants us to have that authority, right? We're not an audit group by any means. We're a criminal investigative agency. So the way that we become involved is when somebody in the transaction, whether that be a buyer or a seller or or a, a real estate agent or the financial institution see something that is suspicious or it appears fraudulent to them and then they contact law enforcement and let us know, hey, something something looks fishy here. That's how we find out about it and eventually get involved. Uh, what about what about the appraisal process? I, I understand that that at least at one time appraisal fraud was was more prevalent than it is now. Is that have you have you noticed that that's a serious issue in today's environment? So it's hard to say once again because you know the 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 market's on the way up, right? But appraisal Indeed. fraud certainly is always something that can be an issue, especially if an appraiser is um, more loyal to one party in the transaction than the other. So obviously, when an appraisal happens, the appraiser is supposed to be um, independent and and you know, hey, here's based on these different factors. Here how, is how much this property is worth. Obviously, if they are you know. Um, you know, receiving special payments or bribes or different things from the buyer, then they're going to devalue the, that property. Sure. If they are um, looking out for the interest for whatever reason that may be, if they're looking out for the interest of the seller, they're going to overvalue the, the property. Or if they are trying to, um, for example, make the property appear to be more valuable so that the purchaser has doesn't have to provide as large of a down payment any of that would be fraudulent activity on the part of the appraiser and anybody else that's colluding with them and as far as making that happen and 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 it would potentially be fraudulent mm -hmm. uh, any suggestions as to how a home buyer or a real estate agent can be sensitive to to red flags if you will uh, any any particular part of the process that we should be aware of? Well, as, where, where we're most vulnerable. So obviously, when uh, for a home buyer, uh, we're all excited to engage in those transactions. It's the mm -hmm. American dream, right? Sure. And Absolutely. so, any time that um, you know someone is engaging in purchasing a property, they just obviously, like I said before. It's so important to be honest, right? It's always important to be honest in every part of your life, but especially when you're dealing with a federally insured financial institution, sure. you're getting that loan. It's really important to be honest and you don't want to end up um, you know, facing uh, fraud charges later. So it's super important to be honest. But then as well, anytime that you're engaging in a, tra in a transaction and something just doesn't quite make sense, or if you don't understand what's going on, people should always ask questions whether it's the buyer, the seller, or the real estate professional, if you don't understand a particular part of the transaction, you should ask questions until you feel confident that you understand what's going on mm -hmm. and that you're comfortable with what is going on as well. Of course. I have read that, that there are literally perhaps millions of, of potential fraud transactions, but they're not discovered. So what would lead to the the discovery of a fraudulent mortgage transaction is there a particular event the biggest thing typically that happens is the loan goes bad and people stop okay, making so payments. at the time of default that's often how we end up becoming involved is because there's a party in the transaction that's now upset right because they're not um, the contract's not being fulfilled mm -hmm. so that's often when we 
first receive a complaint. It's not the only way we can receive, we can receive a complaint, but it's certainly the most mm -hmm. common. Who do you get the complaint from? Is it the bank or someone involved in the transaction other than the bank? Oftentimes it's the financial institution because they're the one that's not receiving the payment on that on the loan. Of course. So we often get contacted by financial institutions who say, hey, you know, this loan has gone bad or we're not receiving payments. And, you know, in looking at the documentation, there's some funny stuff here. Then we can get involved and start investigating that sort of thing. But sometimes it can be other members of the transaction as well that uh, over the course of, of the life of the, the contract, they discover that there is something funny that they think could be fraud. I think our viewers would be interested in sort of some of the procedural things uh, that you can, you can talk about. Uh, let's say then a hypothetical case, default occurs, the bank just senses that there is something irregular, and they call the FBI. What would be your first or, or an agent's first step. What would you, what would you do once you got that tip? So we'd want to review the documentation ourselves, right? Okay. So if if someone in the transaction, the financial institu institution, or someone else says like, "Hey, this particular document looks a little funny," or based on hindsight, now looking back on this document, we don't think this is accurate. So we're going to look at that as well, and and you know take different steps to find out. Okay, is the information on this on this form? accurate or not. Kind of the most recent example of that is um, uh, not, not with real estate, but with the pandemic the, in, in 2020, 2021, the federal government uh, started doing paycheck protection program loans, mm -hmm. PPP loans. And um, there's, there's the potential for fraud, certainly in those loans in claiming how many employees somebody has. So what we do with those is we, um, you know, if someone claims to have 30 employees and they have zero, then obviously that's a problem and that's fake documentation that they submitted to the sure. bank. You know, you think about the uh, the potential and the number. There are something like 5,000 banks. There's approximately that many credit unions. And I'm not sure how many mortgage banks there are, but there are literally thousands and thousands of transactions created every, every month, every mm -hmm. year. And I just can't imagine the number of potential fraud transactions in relation to the number of agents that you would have. It, it, I guess where I'm going with this is it seems like that it's a monumental task that would require thousands of hours and thousands of agents. Right. Well, obviously, we... Uh we're not, we don't catch everything bad that happens, but we're trying to be that deterrent to keep people honest, right? Uh, sure. It's kind of like your house, right? You have a lock on it, but somebody could kick down the door. The lock is there to just be that deterrent. That's what we are as well. So um, when we find out about fraud, we investigate, we aggressively investigate it and seek prosecution in those matters. Mm -hmm. And hopefully that acts as a, a deterrent from other people doing that, that same behavior. Probably a difficult question, but how long does it take to, once you get the phone call, to the time you determine that, yes, this is a prosecutable case? Is that is that a matter of, of weeks or months or? Well, it could be any, any number of uh, timelines. Uh, it's going to depend on how busy we are at the time. It's going to depend on how, how obvious the fraudulent documentation is um, and, and how quickly we can we can gather the evidence we need and, and also how cooperative uh, people involved are. Sure. Once you make that determination, then what's the next step? Do you turn that over to the prosecuting attorney with, with your recommendation? Yeah. So in the federal system, the way that it works is the FBI, well, the FBI and lots of other agencies as well investigate crimes. So we collect evidence as investigators, um, whether that be paper documentation or interviews that we conduct. And once, uh, once our investigation is complete, then we turn all that documentation over to the uh, local United States Attorney's Office. So in Utah, that's the U United States Attorney's Office for the District of Utah. We turn it over to them, they review it, and then they det make the determination whether, it'll be there, whether they will, there will be criminal charges or not. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that, that our systems will progress to the point where uh, mortgage fraud will be greatly contained or maybe even eliminated at, at some point? Do you think technology will lead us to that 
that point? Well, probably not, uh, because as technology evolves and protects more against fraud, um, people come up with new ways to with commit new it. creative, sure. And additionally, with all the safeguards in place that financial institutions have, um, you know, if there's collusion between the parties to defraud the financial institution, they can get past a lot of those safeguards. So there's certainly always going to be the potential for fraud. So lots of uh, employment security for me, but uh, obviously we want people to be honest and 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 not to potentially get themselves in into a bad situations. Sure. Are, are there any unique or unusual mortgage fraud cases that uh, immediately comes to mind that you can share with us? Well, yeah, I'd love to share a, a local one, but uh, first, if you'd allow me, I'd, I'd like to just talk a little bit about business email compromise for a second. Absolutely. It's a big problem in real estate transactions right now here in Utah and all across the United States. And basically what happens is someone's preparing to purchase a home or other property. And so they're waiting for, they have wiring information, if you will, or this is probably the most common way that it happens, but they have wiring information to send their down payment or other escrow payments to, um, to, to the title company or whoever. Um, and um, as they're preparing to make that transaction, either their email account or someone else involved in the transaction, their email account has been compromised by a scammer who then sends a new email to the, the victim, um, often or almost always the buyer of the property, which will say, oh, hey, there's been a change. You need to send your money to this different, use this different wiring information. And that new wiring information is fraudulent is what happens, right? And so then the victim sends that money. A few days go by and other people involved in the transaction say, hey, are you going to wire the money? And they and the victim says, what are you talking about? I already wired the money. So that's a huge problem in the United States right now, especially as we rely more and more on nonverbal communications. So um, I would just encourage your listeners uh, to you know admonish their clients if you're going to send your wire, wire your wire your funds, confirm where that money should go. Talk to the actual person you're working with, whether it with whoever you're going to be wiring the money to, and confirm that wiring information to ensure that it's going to the right person and not to a fraudulent entity. Along those same lines, if um, it's going to continue to happen, so if if one of your listeners or one of their clients ends up wiring money to what they later determined to be a fraudulent account instead of the correct account, they should contact the FBI immediately and we will do everything we can to try to help them to recover those funds. And the sooner that we know about the fraudulent transaction, the more helpful we can be and, and the less helpful we can be as time goes on. So timeliness in these types of things are really important and also, once again, to hammer home, like home, it's really important to make sure you're having those voice communications and confirming where you need to, to send these wires, because obviously they're often very large. As far as like an interesting um, uh, kind of loan fraud case that, that I worked was on a commercial loan where they uh, there was several different uh, uh, car washes that were being sold. So the kind of mortgage facilitator, the buyer and the seller all entered into a conspiracy to inflate the price of these car washes. One, because the buyer didn't have any money to put down. And so to make it a more manageable amount, they inflated the price by a very significant amount. Um, and um, in doing so, the, the loan was such that the car washes were unable to support the transaction or support the you know, the payments that were going to have to be made to the bank. And so the the, the loan went bad. And um, all three of those co-conspirators, the, the buyer, the seller, and the, the loan facilitator, all ended up getting charged federally with crimes. Because once again, it's all about telling the truth. Um, and if it's something that that the bank would need to use or it, whatever financial institution it is, if it's something that they would need to use to make a good decision about risk and about whether they would be willing to, to make that loan, that's information that all the parties involved should be really motivated to share to make sure that they're being upfront and forthcoming and not engaging in fraud. Certainly. Uh, we have time for, for one more question. What happens to the property 
uh, it, once you prosecute a case and it, it, it becomes, uh, they're, they're convicted of the crime, what happens to the property? And then who actually takes the loss? So it's typically the financial institution that's going to be taking the loss. It's obviously based kind of each transaction can be a little different, but whoever is whoever's holding that loan, they're going to end up taking the loss. Although if someone ends up getting charged with a crime, they're going to be, end up owing that, that money for forever until they pay it back as part of their criminal penalty. Um, as far as the property is concerned, by the time we get involved, there's often been a foreclosure. And so the, the financial institution is already trying to liquidate that asset sure. and, and recover as much of, of the loan proceeds as they can. Sure. Well, I'm sorry to say that's all the time we have for today's program. Agent Scown, thank you so much for being with us. We appreciate uh, your time and thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. That concludes this episode of Stringham Real Estate Edge. Today's program was brought to you by Stringham Schools, educating real estate professionals since 1989. Visit stringhamschools.com to learn more. We want to thank today's guests, and don't forget to tell us what you think in the comments section below. I'm Gary Barnes, and I'll see you on the next episode of Stringham Real Estate Edge.